Distinguished past presidents, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> this institution has conferred upon me a tremendous honor and has provided me with an amazing opportunity in appointing me as its 100th president, for which I am wholeheartedly grateful. The weight of responsibility is enormous, but the road ahead, although challenging, is exciting, and I count on your support as we walk it together. The choice of title for this address is almost automatic, given it is the year 2020. It's opportune to pause and reflect on what has been achieved under the leadership of 99 illustrious past presidents. The Welsh poet William Henry Davies wrote, What is this life of full of care? We have no time to stand and stare. No time to see in broad daylight streams full of stars like skies at night. A poor life this, if full of care. We have no time to stand and stare. Recent past presidents have been very much contemplating the future of our profession and how we must adapt and develop to meet the evolving challenges that face us. In Faith Wainwright's presidential year, Council was tasked to consider developing trends, methods and materials and the outcome was the seminal strategy publication entitled The Future of Our Profession. <clears throat> the board formally adopted the report's recommendations and the institution's April 2019 technical conference entitled Strategically Shaping the Future of Our Profession explored three of the seven key issues in greater depth. Those were data and artificial intelligence, the future of education for engineers, and the big subject of resilience. The institution has since set up a task group to actively monitor progress as initiatives are rolled out across the institution, and the various committees and panels are also theming their activities around the key priority areas. <clears throat> Although the, the intention of this address is not to stargaze into the future as others have done, the wisdom of the philosopher Confucius is relevant when he said, study the past if you would define the future. And technologist Mike Evakak gave this a slight twist um, when he opined, for an understanding of the future, look to the past. <clears throat> he went on to say the past and the future are actually not so different. Every past event has a cause or causes that as we look back at them, typically make sense to us from our vantage point in the present. Likewise, each past event has implications and influences the events that follow it. Firstly then, let's recap historically as to how, when and why the institution originated and developed. <clears throat> It was on the 21st of July, 1908, that a small group of eminent architects and engineers, led by Edwin O. Sachs, met in the smoking room of the Ritz Hotel in London. Concrete was the emerging material of the day, and it was decided to set up a specialist learned society devoted to defining standards and rules for the proper use of that specific material. Uh, for acceptance in the, Lundy, in the London County Council regulations and for the construction industry in general. And so the body was first called the Concrete Institute. Incidentally and ironically, most of you will know that the Ritz was actually the first steel frame building in London. <laughs> A bit ironic. It quickly became obvious that the membership was too restricted and so in 1912, the focus widened and the title expanded to the Concrete Institute, an institution for engineers, architects, etc. The First World War intervened and impeded growth and depleted membership. Then in 1922, recognizing there was more to life than, than concrete and that other materials were also developing, the name of the corporate body changed to what we know it as today, the Institution of Structural Engineers. 
The first branch to be formed was Lancashire and Cheshire in 1922, closely followed by Western Counties in 1923, Yorkshire the following year, as well as Midland Counties. The Irish branch was formed in 1926, by which time the institution membership had grown to over 1,700. Then in 1932, overseas representatives were appointed in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and India. And in 1937, the first overseas branch, later to become a division, was founded in South Africa. The institution gained its Royal Charter in May 1934, and a supplemental charter was later granted in November 1965. I thought it was perhaps appropriate to look back over the past 112 years and take some periodic snapshots and to explore issues which were relevant and pertinent at those particular milestone dates. Time only permits to look at the 1st, the 10th, the 25th, and the 75th inaugural addresses. Let's see if there's any commonality and if history does indeed repeat itself. The first president was the Honourable Robert Windsor Clive, the first Earl of Plymouth. He was a politician of some note and was the first Commissioner of Works from 1902 to 1905. He didn't actually deliver a formal address, but said a few words at the luncheon which marked the establishment of the Institute in July 1908. His main theme was the cosmetics and aesthetics of buildings, and he is on record as saying, we have got to get out of any new material, and he of course was referring to concrete, the best we can, and so fashion and form it that it will be an element of beauty. So the first actual presidential address was delivered in 1911 by Sir Henry Tanner, who was a prominent architect and who was knighted in 1904. It was untitled, but he highlighted several main issues. The first, the first being competence, and he spoke of competence including the need to provide members with good technical guidance, including a regular journal and the aspiration to introduce an examination. And he also spoke of competition and tendering for work which was driving down cost and the need for the designer to become an independent consultant instead of working for the contractor as was the then norm. Um, of interest, even though it was some 110 years ago, he spoke of the need to design structures to prevent fire spread, uh, refer referring to it as fireproofing. The modern term is, of course, fire safety. The tenth address was delivered by Henry James Dean, consulting engineer, in 1927. He succeeded Sir Charles Ruthen, who unfortunately passed away before he had completed his term of office. Again, Dean's inaugural address bore no, to no title, but his main topics were the construction materials then available to the structural engineer, and there were four of them, concrete, steel, timber and masonry. And he also spoke about institution governance and the need for a robust committee structure, as he called it, with four headline committees. He called them sectional committees to develop the understanding of those four principal design materials. The 25th president, Gower Pym, had a military background and appears to have been a specialist in geotechnics and foundations. He gave another untitled address in October 1944 and majored on the need of collaboration with allied professionals and corporate specialism, as he described it, founded upon and reliant on fundamental research. We come to the 50th address given by Bernard Stone of Andrews Kent and Stone fame. Ewart Andrews was the 15th president and Lewis Kent the 40th. And that firm also went on to produce the 75th president, I don't see him in the audience, David Lazenby. Stone's address, delivered in 1969, was very wide-ranging and was entitled The Role of the Consulting Engineer in the 70s. He majored on the need, firstly, for good communication 
and also for collaboration with other professionals and with contractors. And in this context, he cited the then recently achieved lunar landing as an outstanding example of teamwork involving, I quote, scientist, technologist, and technician, unquote. He also spoke about competence and said, for example, we must be expert in those matters in which we claim to be experts. And another topic was communities and the desire to have a broader membership. Professor Patrick Dowling, the 75th president, was singular in the content of his address delivered in October 1994. It was simply but poignantly entitled, Communication or Isolation. So this all clearly shows that the primary topics, we call them the four C's, and if you noted Bernard Stone had them all in his address, um, the firstly is that of competence, secondly, communities, thirdly, collaboration, and fourthly, communications. These have been constant considerations of the institution as it has developed over the years. While the specifics of the challenges, opportunities, and pressures that face us today may be different, few would argue, therefore, that history does indeed repeat itself. And the four main C's remain every bit as important as the institution charts its position in the future as in the here and now. None of these addresses, however, mention climate change because this issue has only come onto the radar in the last few decades. And thankfully, it is now very high on the agenda of most organizations. We shall now briefly, as part of the 2020 vision, consider six main topics in the form of an acrostic. V stands for values. Professional competence and the communities we serve are still the main focus of our raison d'etre. The institution's professional examinations differentiate us from other engineering institutions and are at a standard recognized to be amongst the highest in the world. And while we strive to widen our membership to embrace a wider community of engineers wherever in the world they practice, we remain committed to the objective of the examination, that is, competence in fundamental engineering principles. The UK's Grenfell Tower tragedy has very starkly highlighted the need for competency in specialist areas, over and above what is tested by our examination. Moving forward, therefore, high-rise and perhaps other types of high-occupancy buildings will be categorised, and it will only be engineers with specific proven competence who will be permitted to design such structures. This is not just a UK phenomenon, and in both Australia and New Zealand, for example, there are significant discussions at governmental level on competency gateways for those in the built environment professions whose safety critical work has significant impacts on the public at large. The institution has already set up specialist diploma accreditation in the areas of offshore, seismic, and fire engineering, and will continue where relevant to establish skills registers. Mandatory reporting of CPD has been in place since 2014, and it permits a very wide and general, general curriculum of learning activity. We may now inevitably, however, be moving towards a culture of CPD, which is both more relevant and specific to our specialisms. And an example already exists under the SER design self-certification scheme, which operates in Scotland and in the Channel Islands. We may even be moving to a system of periodic reaccreditation or re-registration, as is the norm, for instance, with structural engineers in Singapore and many other professions and organizations. For example, ROSPA qualified advanced motorcyclists and drivers have to retest every three years to maintain their higher standard license. The same is true with certain IAM road smart license classes. 
And following the May 2018 issue of Dame Judith Hackett's post-Grenfell report on the review of building regulations, the sector was tasked to undertake a comp comprehensive review of competency requirements across all aspects of the industry. Led by the Construction Industry Council, some 150 organizations have been involved, including our own. And we believe it is almost certain that there will be an inevitable push towards tighter regulation of competence. Moving forward, therefore, demonstration of competence will continue to be a very significant issue for us all. The international reach of the institution provides us with the ideal opportunity to learn from competency schemes operating in other parts of the world. And so collectively, we must embrace these challenges and convert them into opportunities. <laughs> Inclusivity in all that we do and strive for must become ever more central in our thinking. In this regard, it is gratifying to see the progress already achieved. In respect of gender, for example, none of the inaugural addresses cited refer to female members. Although interestingly, the first woman to join this institution was a Florence Mary Taylor in 1926 when she uh, became an associate member. Sarah Buck, who we're glad to have with us this evening, was the institution's 88th and first female president, followed by our 98th president, Faith Wainwright, and my successor and 101st president, if all goes to plan, will be Jane Entwistle. In 2019, 39% of the board was female and 46% was non-UK. This year, 36% of the board is female and 43% is non-UK, but the result is slightly skewed by having one additional board member. <clears throat> With regard to council, last year 28% was female and more than 30% was non-UK. This year shows a slight drop, 25% of the council is female, 27% is non-UK. Slight blips like this are to be expected, but the situation is being proactively monitored by the institution. Although the institution has come a long way, we cannot, however, be complacent, and we must continue to strive to be all embracive. Not only does the institution have to be inclusive, it has to grow and nurture the international community, and this topic will be discussed under a later heading. We must continue to give our members, particularly in smaller practices, the support they need, both in terms of technical and business guidance. The Essential Knowledge Text and Business Practice Notes series produced by the institution have proved to be a, a tremendous success, embracing a wide spectrum of fundamental engineering and business relevant information. It is also gratifying to highlight, based on membership surveys, the vital and pivotal role which our magazine entitled The Structural Engineer continues to play in this respect it has been a privilege for me to have been involved over a 27-year period with the editorial team and with the evolution of the structural engineer from a hybrid journal into a standalone publication. Incidentally, if you're observant, you will notice that the April 1992 edition, when I joined editorial, was a Northern Ireland special. <laughs> that was purely by coincidence. October last year saw the unveiling of the new rebrand look on the right of the picture. That transformation has also seen the launch of our own research online journal entitled Simply Structures. And both titles are highly acclaimed and each issue has something of relevance to the various communities and special interests of the institution's international readership. In particular, the technical guidance notes series based on the readership surveys, remains the most popular element, with professional guidance coming a close second. One of our most vibrant communities, and we speak of them with pride, is that of our young professionals who go from strength to strength and whose talent and enthusiasm know no bounds. With some 50% of our membership 
in the student and graduate grades. We are an increasingly youthful organization and this bodes so well for the future of the institution. In our rapidly evolving and developing world, the ability to communicate effectively and efficiently with our members and communities is of paramount importance. And to this end, the institution is investing heavily in its digital transformation project to facilitate the requisite connectivity. This is a, a longer term program over the next three to four years that has already commenced with the revamped and very welcome new website, which was delivered in the middle of last year. With our collective passion for structural engineering and matters relating to the built environment, it would be very easy to overlook the institution's formal status as a charity. Charities, as you know, operate by virtue of their contribution to public benefit. And in our specific field, uh, the safety of, of the public broadly summarizes our principal obligation as a charity. We discharge this duty primarily through our interests in the competence of structural engineers and the communities through which our members share and learn from one another. The institution gained charitable status in 1964 and strives proactively to keep up to date with best governance practice and to meet the requirements and recommendations of the Charities Commission. Our governance is reviewed on a periodic basis and one of the recommendations of the last review was to separate out the roles of president and the board chairman. The overarching benefit will be to optimize board efficiency in dealing with an ever increasing workload. And so for better or for worse, your 100th president will go down in history as the first president not to chair the board. He will, however, continue to chair council. And we wish the new board chairman, Peter Terrell, who's with us this evening, every success and assure him of our full support as we enter this new era of governance. He brings a welcome new dimension to the institution. The letter I is for inspiring others. There is always a need to attract others into our profession and the best way still of achieving this is to tangibly inspire with the work we produce. The institution's special awards help promote this ideal, celebrating as they do creativity and the best in structural engineering on a worldwide stage. The question is often asked of me, why did you become an engineer? Well, I was born and brought up in Northwest Zambia. And before I ever knew what an engineer was, there were two iconic bridges which mesmerized me and filled me with a sense of awe and wonder. The first was the largely unknown suspension footbridge at Chinyingi over the mighty upper Zambezi River, not far, not far south from the Angolan border. At that time, and it may still be so, it was the only bridge on that vast section north of Victoria Falls. A priest whose name was Crispin Baleri, who was stationed on the West Bank, solicited redundant steel cable and structural steel sections from the copper mines in central Zambia. With engineering tuition, for he had never read engineering at university, and with a bit of trial and error, and it is reputed San Francisco's iconic Golden Gate Bridge is his model, <laughs> he managed to construct this fantastic structure, wait for it, with a span of some 340 meters. To account for the sag and the river's flood levels, he had to raise the height of the towers several times. And in addition to that, he had to retrofit the lateral stay cables, which you can just about see. This, is, this was bridges to prosperity for an isolated community before the term was ever coined. And to say the bridge is lively to cross is an understatement. <laughs> The second is the famous 158 meter steel arched Victoria Falls Road and Rail Bridge. It was the brainchild of Cecil Rhodes and was designed by Freeman Fox and Partners, then called Douglas Fox and Partners. And interestingly, today it is one of the most popular bungee jump locations in the world, if you're interested. <laughs> Unwittingly, therefore, those two bridges inspired me to become an engineer. 
Inspiration, however, also comes from people. And there were two men, unfortunately, neither of them could be here tonight. Professor Adrian Long, when I was at Queen's University, and Dr. Gordon Millington, when I started professional life. I often say that Gordon taught us to think outside the box before the term was ever invented. He taught us to push the boundaries and more importantly, to believe in ourselves. And as a result, a very rewarding career unfolded, which culminated firstly in the Waterfront Hall Belfast, a two and a quarter thousand seater multi-configuration concert venue, which features the terraced vineyard concept of seating. That's a picture of the opening night in 1997. And uh, some of my colleagues are here tonight and I are, can be spotted somewhere in that big audience. It, was, uh, it, it won a structural awards special commendation from this institution in 1997. In the same year, it won the Concrete Society Award outright. And then the following year, it won the International FIP Award for Outstanding Structures. Um, the average age of my team in completion was just under 30. That's quite amazing when you reflect on it. We had young, inspired people, and we produced innovative solutions to what was a very complex and challenging design brief. Then more recently came a diversification into the specialist area of forensic engineering and expert witness. And as a result of that, I'm now like some in the audience trying to educate others as to what can go wrong in projects and the very costly pitfalls to avoid. A recent example is a major infrastructure project in Hong Kong comprising an underground extension to an existing mainline railway station. Major public safety concerns were sparked in mid-2018 when a whistleblower alleged that shortcuts and malpractice had taken place. The chief executive of the Hong Kong government immediately set up a high-level commission of inquiry to investigate the safety of the structures. Don't ask me how, but I was appointed as engineering uh, expert advisor to the commission and gave my final evidence to the hearing just finishing this day last week in Hong Kong. And I'm so pleased and indeed honored that Professor Peter Hansford, commissioner to that inquiry, is with us in the audience this evening. Sir, you are most welcome. Thank you so much for coming. So we in turn have an obligation not only to attract young people into engineering, but to mentor our younger professionals, and to inspire them towards creativity, ever making them aware of the bear traps that need to be avoided. Sarah Buck, in her inaugural address, used a similar word, enthuse. And we have all benefited from the inspiration and guidance of structural engineering professionals as our careers have developed. As part of our 2020 vision, I encourage all of you to consider what you are prepared to do to support the next generation. S, the letter S stands for society. Everything we do impacts on society, even though the public at large have little realization of the significance of our work or the value of our contribution. And things tend only to make news headlines when they go badly wrong. For example, the recent tragic bridge collapses at Florida International University in March 2018 and in Genoa in August 2018, and there are a host of others. This institution is a key member of CROSS, SCOS. For those of you unfamiliar, CROSS stands for the Confidential Reporting and Structural Safety, and SCOS stands for the Standing Committee on Structural Safety. This is a tripartite organization which includes the Institution of Civil Engineers and the Health and Safety Executive. It has done sterling work led by Dr. Alistair Sohn. The aim, derived from aviation and other industries, is to learn from failures in a non-adversarial and non-recriminatory manner and then to disseminate that knowledge so that the same mistakes critically inform professional practice and do not recur in the future. 
Similar schemes are gaining impetus in Germany and South Africa. The UK model, as you've just heard, is now starting to be rolled out internationally with the establishment of Cross Australia in 2018 and Cross US launched, as you heard, last year in June. In June 2019, the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government published its response in the form of a consultation document to implement the recommendations of the post-Grenfell Hackett report. It appears likely that the government will introduce a cross-based whole life system of reporting, beginning at least with high-rise, high-occupancy buildings. That would result in tremendous kudos for Cross and would reflect the vital nature of its model and work. Climate change may be a myth to some skeptics, but it is a frightening reality that will test the future resilience of our infrastructure. It rains a lot in our neck of the woods in Northern Ireland compared with many other regions of the UK. On the back of at least 10 significant climate events in just a few years, the Committee on Climate Change in its summary report for Northern Ireland predicted that by the end of this century, summer rainfall will reduce by up to 41%. Winter rainfall will increase by 27%. Temperatures will increase between 0.8 and 4.2%. The main culprit, of course, is CO2, carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. The depletion of the Earth's natural resources and the need to reduce carbon emissions weigh heavily on our collective shoulders. Under the Climate Change Act in 2008, the UK government set a 2050 target of reducing emissions by 80%. That, however, was amended in June last year by the then Prime Minister, Theresa May, to a new, more stringent goal of net zero greenhouse gases by the year 2050. This, therefore, is a hugely significant challenge for all built environment professionals to come to terms with. Last July, the institution set up an online declaration, as you've heard about again this evening, as did other professional bodies, under the banner, UK Structural Engineers Declare Climate and Biodiversity Emergency. That invited sign-up from company CEOs. The commitment was to commission and design buildings, cities, and infrastructures as indivisible components of a larger, constantly regenerating and self-sustaining system in balance with the natural world and to strengthen our working practices to create structural engineering outcomes that have more positive impact on the world around us. In addition, the IPCC, that stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the United Nations body responsible for assessing the science related to climate change, warned in October 2018 of the need to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade for a climate safe future. Climate change therefore remains one of the biggest challenges to the institution and its members moving forward. This wake up call requires not simply a step change, but a quantum leap change in our mindset, <laughs> attitude and process if we are to stem the inevitable tide and preserve planet Earth. Our main focus in this respect must be on reducing our overall carbon usage. In this respect, the joint research project MICON, that stands for Minimizing Energy and Construction, by the University of Cambridge and University of Bath, is to be applauded and, and encouraged. Their survey of structural engineering practice report issued in August 2018 highlights that buildings account for almost 40% of energy-related CO2 emissions, some 28% of that being the cost of construction. Significant cuts have been made in operational embodied carbon to the point where net zero is now achievable, whereas, if you look at that slide, the embodied carbon, the darker blue of the structure, has changed very little with time. Positive action is therefore now urgently required. 
It is generally accepted that the structure accounts for typically 60 to 70 percent of the total embodied carbon of, for example, a typical tall building. The institution first published guidance on the subject of embodied carbon in building structures in 2011. Some useful data was then presented, but more up-to-date and more extensive information now needs to be compiled to develop a common base user-friendly carbon calculator. We need to promote carbon counting and, if necessary, to lobby government to make it compulsory. We need to make it a criteria, for example, when judging our structural awards. A headline report issued in June 2019 by C4 Cities, Arup and the University of Leeds with support from the City Foundation, explores the impact that urban consumption has on global greenhouse gas emissions and assesses what individuals, businesses and governments can do to reducing consumption-based emissions within cities and beyond. It presents some rather startling facts. The targets identified therein for us as structural engineers are extremely challenging. For example, a 20% reduction in demand for new buildings, 22% of all building elements needing to be recycled, a 35 percent reduction in steel and a 56 percent reduction in cement across all our projects. 90 percent of all residential buildings and 70 percent of all commercial buildings to be constructed in timber. 61 percent of cement to be replaced with low carbon alternatives. And in addition, we need to actively continue to research and promote performance-based design as an alternative to prescriptive codification in order to optimize structural efficiency. We need to promote the use of timber, which could reduce deliveries to building construction sites by 60%. And all of this would achieve a 29% reduction in CO2 emissions in this industry, and as the absolute minimum required, by the way, to achieve the requisite 44% target in carbon reduction. We also need to educate our clients and to help them better understand the implications of their decisions. We must aim for new buildings to have a design life of a minimum of 100 years and preferably 200 years. And we need to design our buildings in such a way that they can, if necessary, be deconstructed and erected again in a different location. <coughs> we also need to embrace and proactively address the 17 UN Sustainability Development Goals. To this end, a half-day workshop was organized and held during the July 2019 Council meeting to stimulate thinking and to develop action plans. The institution subsequently established a climate emergency task group to ensure a proactive response to this critical challenge. This comprises four main strands policy and standards, communications and upskilling, sharing performance data and best practice, knowledge, teaching, and research stroke industry collaboration. Even at a grassroots level, however, we can all make some kind of a voluntary contribution to society and the UN SDGs. Whether in promoting engineering at primary or secondary school level, even at tertiary stage, or mentoring within our organizations, or we might even be able to use our training skills and experience to engage hands-on to deliver or develop basic infrastructure for a deprived community. The Bridges to Prosperity program previously mentioned is highly commendable in this respect. We were privileged to return to Dipalata in Northwest Zambia in 2015 to the little mission station where we first lived to give something back to the villagers there. Prior to that, we had designed on a voluntary basis with the input of a benevolent architect friend, a new 20 bed maternity hospital with operating theater. Next came an airstrip followed by a 10 bed male surgical ward extension, which we were supposed to assist with but when we arrived, it was ahead of schedule. So instead, we were given 
a six meter high steel water tower to erect on a pre-constructed raft foundation. Uh, timber is no good in the tropics because the termites attack it. We had minimal scaffolding, a few surplus timber planks, one antiquated pulley block, and three villagers with no experience of any construction work, never mind erecting steelwork. The chap on the ground with the, with the yellow hard hat which I gave him was of course the gaffer. And the other interloper to his left was just there to make sure the gaffer and the rest of us were doing it right. <laughs> Bilharzia is an endemic problem there. It's a parasitic disease which is waterborne. The villagers wash in the river and drink from the river and nearly everyone contracts this organ attacking illness which can lie dormant for years. It was discovered that Deep Alada had an excellent artesian groundwater source and the previous year other volunteers from Canada had drilled several wells and left them ready for connecting to. So we erected the steel tower and storage tank and installed several hundred meters of um, supply and distribution, feed, feed and distribution water pipe complete with a wellhead pump. We had only 10 days in which to complete the work, but with good project management, of course, and hard work, and a few hair-raising moments, we completed in an aggregate of only five days, which left some time for sightseeing. I can honestly say it was the most rewarding project of my career. And you can see the gaffer there, he's pulling rank. He's sitting higher than the rest. <laughs> the Water tower in the background was one, by the way, we designed some 30 years ago to store pumped river water. Those villagers now have a reliable and sustainable source of potable water, and the Bilharzia will eventually be brought under control. In some small measure, therefore, two of those UNSDGs were partially addressed, the first being health and well-being, and the second, access to water. The moral of the story is that as engineers, we can make a tangible and positive contribution in so many different ways to society. Please ask yourself, how can I help? The second I is for a topic I'm very uh, passionate about, institutionalizing the institution, internationalizing the institution. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting tongue-tied. <laughs> The growth, the growth and reach of the institution beyond its UK foundation is part of its strength and truly does enable us to be considered and recognized as an international organization. In many ways, however, and for which there need be no apologies for the institution's British roots, we have not always modified our language nor adopted the behaviors that move us away from our UK centricity. Ultimately, this will hold us back, and the board is now fully engaged in considering how we structure and position the institution to become truly international, dare we say global, in the years ahead. To achieve that global position, a radical overhaul of our basic structure, which has evolved since the formation of the institution is now required. Thanks to the advantages of digital communications, we now have the exciting prospect of enhanced engagement from even more members based outside the UK. And with that, our ability to share and learn and grow rises exponentially. Inclusivity takes on a new meaning. And with it, an institution comprising UK plus overseas members must rapidly become a notion consigned to a bygone era. A shift in electoral representation, however, will be required to mirror more realistically the needs of an international membership. And our strength as an inclusive professional cohort will give greater opportunity and clearer routes for members to both contribute and to aspire to formal leadership positions within this institution. Equitable solutions will, however, require compromise and the adoption of new ways of thinking we all recognize the world is changing, and with it, the institution too must continue to change and adapt to remain relevant not only to its professional members, but also in its ability to discharge its obligations for public benefit. We come now to the letter O. 
Reverting again to the world of advanced motorcycling and motoring, OAP um, is an acronym which stands not for old age pensioner as you might first think, but for observation, anticipation and planning. Put simply, on a rolling basis, one has to constantly glean all available information on the road and traffic conditions. One then has to use experience and judgment to anticipate different scenarios developing. And then one has to continuously and dynamically plan to deal with those emerging situations. Closely allied with this concept is the system of advanced motorcycle riding, commonly referred to as IPSCA, as contained in the Police Motorcycle Roadcraft Handbook. It becomes second nature to an advanced rider because it is, I quote, a way of approaching and negotiating hazards that is methodical, safe, and leaves nothing to chance, unquote. The flexible system consists of information processing and four phases, position, speed, gear, and acceleration. Each phase develops from the preceding one and the processing of information is central to the entire system. The analogy to us as an institution moving in a rapidly evolving hazardous and changing world is strikingly obvious. We need to be ever aware of what is going on around us and ahead of us. We need to aim to where we want to be position wise. We need to be moving at the correct pace and with sufficient flexibility to stay out of trouble and to take advantage of each successive challenge and opportunity. Finally, you'll be pleased the letter N. I, initially, I wrote the next 100 years, but then changed it to the next 30 years. The government's hugely challenging net carbon zero edict must be achieved within the next 30 years. In context, it is sobering to realize that the majority of our members will still be practicing in 2050. Rather than trying to crystal ball the changes another century will bring, the exponential rate of change demands that we perhaps more reali realistically consider 30 as the new 100. In conclusion, let me leave you then with a series of rhetorical questions. What massive step changes will the 130th president reflect on? What skills will a structural engineer have and need in the year 2050? What will have happened to planet Earth's climate? What will the 130th president identify as the issues and challenges of the future? Which country will he or she be from? Where will the institution's headquarters be? What medium will be used to deliver the 130th inaugural address? I could go on. But it is likely with the current rate of change that even using our wildest imagination, we would get it badly wrong both in content and direction. Ladies and gentlemen, you have listened patiently to me trying to look at things in perspective, for which I, am, I thank you sincerely. In conclusion, there are three immediate areas of priority which we as an institution need to focus on in order to remain ahead of the game in a world of unprecedented and accelerating change. The first is competence and how it will need to be tested. The second is climate change and how we both corporately and as members rise to the challenge to crisis manage our rapidly depleting resources. And the third is creating and proactively developing a truly international and representative institution. As I close, there are two people in particular I would like to acknowledge and express my thanks to. The first is the institution's librarian, Rob Thomas, for his help with the historical research. And the second is Will Arnold, his name has already been mentioned this evening, for his input into the section on climate change and for his permission to use some of his graphics. Thank you to all who are here in person this evening. Your support is appreciated. And thanks to all who have been following on live stream wherever you are in the world, in particular to the members of the Northern Ireland region who have congregated themselves in the Mac Theatre 
um, downtown Belfast, and also to my RPS colleagues in Elmwood House and possibly in other offices. Your support is highly appreciated and thank you for listening so patiently.